Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Woods panel on ice sheets and sea level rise. Uh, I just want to start out by thanking uh, Chris Field, the director of the Woods Institute, and the Woods Institute itself for allowing us and enabling us to have this conversation today. Um, the Woods Institute is Stanford's hub for interdisciplinary research um, and allows us to do all sorts of exciting things, including these uh, panel discussions and webinars, which I've really enjoyed and, and is a, really a privilege to, to convene one in my core area of ice sheets and sea level rise. Uh, I'm Dusty Schroeder, I'm the convener. I'm an associate professor in geophysics uh, and by courtesy in the Department of Electrical Engineering and a, a center fellow with the Woods Institute by courtesy. Um, sea level rise is a hugely consequential and very vivid impact of climate change. Um, one of the greatest sources of uncertainty in sea level rise is the contributions of ice sheets. This is challenging for lots of reasons. There are scientists who work both on the impacts and on understanding ice sheets themselves. Other uh, scientists include observationalists like myself, geoscientists who understand the history and, and past uh, glacial cycles and behaviors of ice sheets, uh, theorists trying to understand the fine scale behavior of ice physics, modelers developing and doing experiments with numerical ice sheet models, uh, and, and risk assessors. And in each piece of that ecosystem of discovery um, and understanding is challenging for, for its own reasons. Uh, some of these are just inherent, inherent challenges of science. Some of it's because this is a young field where we're still making discoveries, uh, which makes it an, an exciting area to work in where you make discoveries and have uh, such consequential impacts. But that's also challenging as we discover new things and it changes how we think of ice sheets. Um, it's also hard to, to make predictions. Uh, ice sheets and their projections, as we'll discuss today, fall somewhere between you know, climate and weather modeling where we understand lots about the physics and see them happening in actions and things like maybe earthquake projection where we know the earth does this and we know uh, the processes that are at play, but we don't always get the opportunity to see those processes playing out in real time to make sure our models are capturing everything. Uh, so this makes it exciting, fun, challenging, and important to work on this area. Um, and it's a delight to convene a panel with some of my favorite people who who work in the space and favorite people in general to discuss this. Um, the format for today, like other uh, Woods panel webinars, is we'll, we'll have an initial discussion amongst ourselves for around the first half hour, and you'll have the opportunity to log your questions into the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen, and then a little over halfway through, we'll pivot to those questions and try and uh, cover as many as we can. So now to give a brief introduction of our panelists. Um, Alan Sarosi is an associate professor of engineering at, Dar at the Dartmouth uh, Thayer School of Engineering. Her research focuses on understanding and explaining ongoing changes in the cryosphere and trying to reduce uncertainties in ice sheet contributions to sea level rise projections uh, by using a combination of process and state-of-the-art numerical modeling studies, as well as remote sensing and in-C2 data. She's received the NASA uh, Early Career Achievement Award, the JPL Charles Alashi Award, and the HU Early Career Award. She's a member of the NASA Sea Level Change Team, uh, is a member of the Steering Committee for the Ice Sheet Model Inter Comparison Project, and before moving to Dartmouth, she was a scientist with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology, where she was a lead developer of the Ice Sheet and Sea Level Systems Model. Catherine Mock is an Associate Professor at the University of Miami's Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. She's also a faculty scholar at the Airbus Center focused on environmental science and policy. Her research assesses climate change risks and response options to address increased flooding, extreme heat, wildfires, and other hazards. She's the recipient of the Pierce Sellers Prize for world leading contributions to solutions focused climate research. Before moving to the University of Miami, she was a senior research scientist here at Stanford and was the director of the Stanford Environment Assessment Facility here at the Woods Institute. She co-directed the scientific activities of Working Group 2 of the International Panel on Climate Change and is a lead author for the IPCC 6 assessment report and a chapter lead for the US 5th National Climate Assessment. Finally, Richard Alley is the Evan P. Professor in the Department of Geoscience in the EMS Environmental Institute at Penn State. His research interests include glaciology, ice sheet stability, paleoclimates from ice cores, the physical property of ice cores, 
and erosion and sedimentation by ice sheets. He's published more than 240 scientific publications about the relationship between Earth's cryosphere and global climate change. He was the lead author of chapter four, Observations, Changes in Snow, Ice, and Frozen Ground for the fourth assessment report of the IPCC. He's chaired the National Research Council on Abrupt Climate Change and published the book, The Two Mile Time Machine, Ice Cores, Abrupt Climate Change in Our Future. He has won numerous awards, including the IGS Society Seligman Crystal, the EGU Lewis Agassiz Medal, and more than I have time to mention now. So to get started in our conversation, I think a, a great place to start would be to, to ask Richard, you know, in your experience of the growth and evolution of glaciology as a field, how has the thinking and talking about ice sheets and their contribution to sea level rise evolved uh, in your experience, both historically and, and personally? Well, thank you. An honor and a privilege to greet so many people out there in Zoom land and to be on the, the same Zoom with these distinguished scholars. Um, I'm an old fart, you know. Um, <laughs> you know the story, and you mentioned the IPCC. The United Nations founded the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to provide guidance to policymakers and the public by assessing the science, not doing it. Um, and it's been doing this for a long time. Uh, for sea level rise, we are warming the world. This is expanding the ocean. It is melting the mountain glaciers. This is raising the sea. It's melting a little bit around Greenland. And then there's this huge gaping uncertainty about ice flow in Antarctica. The most recent IPCC, Antarctica has enough ice to raise sea level 186 feet. The high end projection, we warm it faster than we expect to by 2100 of that 186 feet, a little less than five inches go into the ocean. And the other 185 point something feet stay in Antarctica. That's the bad case, okay? So when you look at what we're expecting from the IPCC, we will get what they say, but the uncertainties are grotesquely on the bad side. It is really, really hard to think of a future that's better than five inches out of 186. It's really, really easy to think of a future that's worse. And what's really evolved in, in my career, my advisor and Charlie Bentley went to Antarctica in 1957, and he discovered that there's this mass of ice that can raise sea level, but it's sitting on a seafloor where it wants to be ocean instead. And since 1957, we've sort of been worried about this and our worries have crystallized. We've learned mechanisms. We see how this could happen. We know that bad things are possible. And we know that we're so deeply uncertain about them that we don't know what to tell people. I have a minor in metallurgical engineering. And our professor said, don't you ever get into a position where you have to tell somebody whether that particular thing is about to break. Build it so you're not close. And we're looking at the edge of Antarctica saying, will it break or not? And we don't know. And if we're wrong, it's not gonna be five inches from Antarctica. It could be five feet, it could be 20 feet, it could be more. Awesome. Thank you for that framing introduction. And I think some of those themes in terms of evolving how we think about the ice sheets and dealing with massive uncertainty of a variety of natures will we'll, we'll come back to, I think, throughout this discussion. Uh, I guess as a follow-up on that, uh, Catherine, as you think about adapting and responding to sea level and consuming these projections put together in the face of some of these uncertainties Richard was just talking about, how has your thinking evolved or what is the way we should think about your thinking as a consumer of these numbers? Yeah, great. And thank you so much, Dusty, for bringing us all together. Um, really a wonderful convening. So as you introduced so eloquently, I think about how we, by which I mean every single community across the United States and frankly the globe as a whole, um, is dealing with the change in climate, impacts that are happening now, and those future risks. And for me, sea level rise is a really powerful entry point 
for thinking about what needs to change and how we deal with water around us. And certainly in the US, um, but in most other countries, many other countries at least, you know, the historic paradigm has been we deal with floodwaters through mechanisms of flood control. But now we're really shifting to an era of flood adaptation, as in we need to be changing the way we deal with flood hazards. I'll just mention three things that I think are deeply relevant to how we deal with sea level rise and adapt to it. And the number one thing is that flood risks are changing with a lot of uncertainty, as Richard described. But we can no longer say that we'll look at a given stretch of shoreline or a given delta region and quantify just how likely a flood is to happen in any given year, pour some concrete, and be done with it, not have to worry about it. Instead, now, we know that the flood risk is changing year over year. And also, it is no longer just about the storms. So it is also the fact that on the high tides, we have water that is now pouring into our roadways or our parking lots, getting in the way of commutes or your ability to go to the grocery store. Um, groundwater is also a big deal. So here in South Florida, for example, our septic doesn't really work as well as it used to. Um, and we also have sea level rise in combination with changing patterns of precipitation, in some cases, changing patterns of storms. So in terms of dealing with floodwaters, sea level rise means that it is always changing now. The next two things I'll mention is, first of all, historically, we have mostly thought about why flooding matters as mostly being an issue of properties being damaged. Nothing like sea level rise in terms of the nature of those risks to really emphasize that this is about health and well-being what comes up in that groundwater coming through the septic, then washing out into your drinking water. And it's also one where we have learned historically that the way we've dealt with flooding often has created a lot of issues of social justice. So we might wanna come back to that. And then the last thing I would just mention um, in terms of how sea level rise changes things up is that given these changing hazards and the diversity of the consequences, we can no longer just silo consideration of flooding into a single office of government and hope to be done with it. Instead, we're increasingly in a world where this is about housing and transport, not just disaster management, not just how we build our levees. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I think, again, you've touched on many things we'll, we'll want to discuss, both in terms of the disparate impacts um, and in terms of how this whole portfolio of infrastructure uh, is impacted by uncertainties that 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 are manifold in their character and extent, and and how we can try and bridge across um, understanding ice sheets and understanding our predictions. Um, on that note, I, I think a, a good opening question uh, for Ellen would be: you know, you're you're developing and running these ice sheet models. You're engaged in both putting physics into those models as we learn them and running them in order to inform what makes its way into the IPCC. So, so in many ways, your work bridges the perspective Richard articulated and then serves uh, the communities that Catherine's talking about. So, so how do you, as you try to do all of that within the context of ice sheet modeling, think about this challenge and, and are, are they related efforts or are they distinct? Thank you, Dustin. First of all, I wanted to start by thanking you for inviting me to be on this panel. It's really an honor to be with all of you today to discuss this question that is really important and, and really important to me. So first of all, I wanted to start by saying that uh, similar to what Richard just explained, ice sheet models have evolved over the past three, four decades. Uh, when we look at what people were, the kind of questions people were interested in like three, four decades ago, Ice sheet models were mostly designed to look at glacial interglacial cycles, and these questions on very long time scales. And as things uh, evolved and we started to realize how uh, ice sheet can contribute to sea level rise relative, on a relatively short time scale compared to these longer time scales, ice sheet models started to evolve to be able to better uh, reproduce these changes, not just on long glacial interglacial timescales, 
but also on much shorter time scale from decade to century. And so um, again, going back to what Richard said about the IPCC, when we look at the role and place of ice sheet models in the IPCC reports, uh, the, the first two reports said that ice sheets were not going to contribute significantly and so were kind of ignored. And as time was going, we started to realize that ice sheet would create, uh, would, would contribute to sea level rise by the end of the 21st century. But the models were not good enough to, to be relied upon. They, they were still too coarse. And the, the ice sheet modeling community has done a tremendous job uh, catching up, being able to better capture the, these smaller timescales and all the processes that we are observing are happening faster than we thought. And until AR, IP, the, the, the um, IPCC AR5, which was a few years ago, uh, projections were not based on physical models because the physical models were not good enough for that. So instead we relied on extrapolating observations, expert elicitations and these kind of things. And for the first time, the last IPCC report was able to include results from dynamic models. And so far for me, for us as a community, this is really great to see that we are now catching up and now we are now able to provide meaningful information for the for climate adaptation for all communities around the globe that need these numbers and and um, so so it's really great to see that changing. Another thing I wanted to mention, as you just said, I, uh, we are at the intersection between uh, we need to understand processes, we need to put that into into models, and we also have to be to to consider that ice sheets are just one part of the climate system. And so we need to not study them isolated from the rest of the climate system, but in link with, um, with ocean changes, atmospheric changes and all of that. And if I can say just one more thing, uh, then I'm happy to go back to that later on. Uh, the models have also evolved with the number and availability of observations. As we start to have more observations from remote sensing field, field of uh, in-situ field work, we can also improve them. And I'll be happy to come back to that later, maybe. Wonderful, yeah, I, th I think, you know, you've touched on several key things we should discuss, you know, the, the question of time scales, providing a, an image into the evolution of, of ice sheet models and the fact that as a community, we're doing a lot of this sort of in real time uh, and the challenge of how to connect observations and modeling to, to to catch up and to constrain these processes meaningfully. I'd love to ask, you know, in, in response to the, the initial introduction Richard gave of first these projections of sea level contributions that you might expect now and the estimates that were included in these assessments and then the fact that much bigger numbers that you started to list could also be on the table. I guess, you know, for Catherine, where you were saying, okay, we have this whole variety of impacts and you have, you know, in, impacts for people, for health, for justice. How do you think about this nature that there are these two, two sets, two kinds of uncertainty? Do you think about it as just grouping, when Richard says that, all of those numbers together? Or do you think of these as sort of two scenarios? Are, do different questions, and different populations uh, care more about one of those scenarios or the other? Uh, how should we be thinking about that from the sort of impacts user side? Um, there's so much there, Dusty. Um, I mean, I guess what I'd say is much of the sea level rise adaptation space, so grappling with rising seas um, as it affects most aspects of you know, a coastal settlement, increasingly the best practice has recognized that there are deep uncertainties. So basically, Dusty, as you're describing, um, deep uncertainty is just another way of saying um, there's that process uncertainty. We don't exactly know uh, the likelihood very precisely of some of these different outcomes, or at least it's a broad range of possible outcomes or that bimodal range at any given point of in time. And that instead of saying we don't know exactly for sure how much the seas will rise in any given point in time, we need to flip that and say, how can be, we be robust um, in the face of that uncertainty? And so some of the places where we see this happening, um, you know, the Dutch would be the classic place to look for so much of flood risk management and certainly many of these methods of decision making under deep uncertainty. But for example, the strategy there is to say for investments they make over the next three decades, how can they 
keep options open for that range of possible levels of sea level rise in the second half of the century into the next century and beyond. And oftentimes looking at the path dependencies. So for example, if we say, let's go for walls, we're just gonna keep water out. Um, there can be real limits with that as an assumed strategy. Number one, super expensive. And a lot of the best economic modeling suggests that keeping water out to about six feet of sea level rise in this century would be something that could be justified on the economic benefits versus costs for only about 13% of the global coastline. Um, so if we probably can't build a wall any, everywhere, and we probably don't want to build a wall everywhere, you lose all of the ecological functioning as well. Um, the next question is, how do we think about these portfolios of responses and keeping options open such that if we need to shift strategy, uh, based on the amount of sea level rise that happens into the future, we can do that. And that involves oftentimes basically thinking about the portfolios of strategy, whether it's the, the wall future or the retreat future or the advanced heavy future or the really all of uh, the above living with water future. What does it mean to keep options open towards them? Um, and let's see, there's a, a whole bunch to be said about social justice, but I, I'd be happy to come back to that in another question too, because I feel like the DMDU space here um, deserves its own airtime. That sounds great. Um, I guess, I guess, Richard, as you hear that description in that menu and think about trying to inform the type of approaches to uncertainty, to navigating pathways that Catherine is talking about, I could imagine as a glaciologist trying to inform that, trying to really think about changes we're seeing now. I could imagine also trying to inform that by modeling future scenarios. I could also imagine trying to inform that by looking at this sort of geologic past and trying to bound what we've seen ice sheets do before. And so when you, where for you do you draw from those or how do you prioritize those types of thinking and trying to inform these types of concrete decisions. Yes, with, with panic and and so so it is. There's an old guidance that comes out of engineering, which is that all extrapolations are overly optimistic. If you want your building to stand up, if you don't want things to break and fall down and kill people, if you stress it beyond the known strength of your material, nature finds novel ways to break and it will break before you expect it. And this is something that's been known for a very long time. It turns out that both Galileo and da Vinci wrote on this, among many others, that, that extrapolations are overly optimistic. If we just take what we know about the ice sheet right now, put it in a model and run it into the future, we're extrapolating. And so the need to look back at what ice has done at the past, the need to look at mountain glaciers running into the ocean and how they fall apart because they're a little warmer and a little wetter than the ice sheets. Um, and Helen knows all of this, of course, but um, the need to bring in the full range of things is just extraordinarily high because of the virtual certainty that if we don't bring in that full range of knowledge that we will underestimate the changes in the ice sheet. Thanks. Yeah, Ellen, when you're thinking of model experiments to run or ways of modifying models, you know, you've got this example Richard's talking about where you can look at other processes in other settings to try and understand them. You know, as a field, we discoveries are still getting made. New processes, we weren't thinking about some of these things Richard's talking about, about nature providing other ways to break, get discovered, get understood, get evaluated. So how do you prioritize the experiments you run, the models you develop, or the processes you try to integrate and understand, again, with the goal of trying to give Catherine something to work with. That's a great question and a, a vast subject to discuss. So, so maybe I'll just mention a few things. So, so ice sheets, one of the challenges we have is that ice sheets respond both on small time scales and very long time scales. So we have these observations for the past 
two, three decades now that have great, with great details, we, we know a lot about what happens, um, but we know mostly about what's happening at the surface of the ice. We observe the velocity of the ice, we observe changes in surface elevation, but we don't know much about what's happening below the surface. And that's one of the great challenges that we have. Each time we have new measurements, we see that there's maybe more water at the base of Greenland that we thought about. That was another paper talking about that just a few weeks ago. Um, and and so, so one, one aspect that I'd like to use models for is to try to get the information we have to to figure out other things that we cannot measure directly. And that, but that works for the, for the research records for which we have a lot of observations. But then as research, Richard was talking about, we, I, we also have information about much further in the past that the geological timescales, but for those, those kind of information that we have, they're a lot more sparse and we have very few points to calibrate models. And so you can, if you have like just one number saying that sea level raised by, two, three, four meters, you don't know where exactly that comes from. What were the processes that drove these changes? And so that's why models are great because you can try a bunch of experiments. So you can try lots of different processes to see which one allow you to capture these things. But because these longer, um, th these observations from the further in the past are not as accurate and it's often a few, some, some information, but quite incomplete, it, op like it leaves the door open to many different processes causing them. And so then we have to try to readjust these things and combine these different timescales that we have in order to make the, the models better. Awesome. Uh, I think, yeah, I, this is a, a theme we'll often hit as I think the fact as a field where we're really doing science in public and, and that's a, a separate, interesting thing to think about how that, that affects what we do. Uh, coming back to Catherine, to your point on sort of environmental justice, I guess a, a question I would ask in, in the specific context of sea level rise is, you know, again, Richard gave this whole wide range of numbers and, and many of us who are in glaciology, you know, were attracted to it because it's a mix of discovery and impact and you want to be, you know, of service to society. And so as you think about those potential numbers, is it the case that certain types of impacts or, or sort of the divide you talked about earlier between economic and infrastructural and, and justice impacts, are there certain numbers? You know, the difference between five inches and six inches is super justice-y, but the difference between 20 and 25 is more economic. Uh, are, there, are there certain areas we should be zooming in if we want to be useful, or, or is that just totally the wrong way to think about it? I like the concept. I think it's kind of like an equity damage function, uh, which the, the impact field hasn't quite picked up yet, but um, definitely could be going there. I mean, I think the way I think about this, and this is um, the focus of most of my work, is that you know when it comes to flooding, um, there's no such thing as a natural disaster. So the, the physical climate system drivers um, are, are hazards, right? It's what is the level of the sea? What is the storm surge? What's the rainfall? What's the storm pattern? What's happening in the river shed? But everything else that leads to damages that matter is constructed by people. So who lives where? Who's behind a flood wall? Does the flood wall, wall hold uh, in a given storm? Um, what's the nature of disaster recovery and relief? What's the quality of the building codes? So given all of that, we know already that just where sea level is right now, there are a lot of equity themes that come into play largely because flood risks are mostly socially constructed despite this pivotal role of the physical climate system. And just to give a, a classic example, you know, who gets displaced permanently after a flood? Oftentimes there is immense racial inequity in that outcome. And the basic idea, you know, Katrina would be one of the, the classic, most visible examples of this, but Mississippi River floods um, before that really demonstrated this. For whom does temporary displacement post-flood become permanent displacement? And uh, Black residents versus white residents historically have seen much larger rates of permanent displacement. Okay, so then specifically for your damage function um, for equity <laughs> related to sea level rise, Dusty, here in South Florida, you know, if we reach nine feet of sea level rise, which obviously is a lot, um, most of the county would be underwater. It's like 10% of the county would not be underwater um, in terms of where people live. Within two feet of sea level rise, it's billions of dollars of assets. Okay, next key thing is that um, 
there are many different flavors of water uh, that pose different forms of risk. So first there's the classic coastal amenity. Here in Miami-Dade, people will pay many millions of dollars for a small plot of grass one foot above sea level. Um, where that is happening, usually it's for the beautiful view, uh, the nice downtown that's adjacent. By contrast, there's also what often is called back bay flooding. So look at the other top side uh, of the water area. And certainly here in Miami-Dade, this is the case throughout much of the United States, those back bay floodwaters are often where low wealth communities reside. So even here in South Florida, as the floodwaters rise with rising seas, we have some households who are the very wealthiest, disproportionately white. And on the inland side of the county, we have um, the largely Hispanic and Latinx neighborhoods, also very high risk of flooding. But then as the seas continue to rise, what we then run into in this county, and there are similar um, dynamics across neighborhoods in many coastal regions, is that in Miami, for example, the construction of the downtown really was linked to racial capitalism. Um, the construction of the highway system displaced the black community. And to this day, the black community largely within Miami lives in two regions, one of which is on high ground. And we're already starting to see small signals of sea level rise in the property markets here in Florida um, that will become bigger into the future invariably, but with a lot of uncertainty. And so the real question is kind of how the rising seas are shifting the geography of risk within any one region. Where are the high value properties, the desired properties, where are the desired properties of tomorrow? And who may be forced out of their neighborhoods as what was once naturally occurring affordable housing suddenly becomes prime land. And so from an equity standpoint, that dynamic picture, kind of just like the dynamics of the ice sheets um, on the social side of the equation is really key for understanding outcomes moving forward. Thank you. I, I, I was reminded in your description there of actually the, the first uh, Woods panel that I participated in, which I think you actually convened. And, and that was the first time I had someone who was in charge, I think it was a community you know, manager from Louisiana who was, who asked something along the lines of like, hey, I'm in charge of this community moving. You know, hey, glaciologists, you know, how far should I move? And uh, in that same panel, there was someone who's managing, I think the giant stadium who, who seemed shockingly up to date on sort of the recent glaciology literature. And, and on the one hand, that's, that's, almost intoxicating to have your field so understood and cared about. Uh, but I guess a question I would ask, you know, maybe I'd love your thoughts, Richard, as we are now doing what, you know, you and Ellen mentioned are sort of normal scientific activities, looking at, you know, a paleoclimate record, looking at rocks, understanding new physics, discovering new processes, modeling them, testing hypotheses, having our opinions and our understanding evolve in a world where community managers are deciding where to move, where everything Catherine's talking about is happening, where professional sports stadium people have opinions about ice cliff instability. Uh, how, the, how does that affect how we behave as knowledge producers? And, it, and is that all for the better? Are there things we should be cautious about? Um, how have you seen those change? Are they good? Huh. So, so, I mean, one thing is one would think possibly that that kind of attention would lead to a lot of positions for our students to solve these problems and for the funding to make this happen. And I'm going to get myself in trouble because we know the stereotype of I'm a scientist, give me money. But this largely, the, the ice side largely lives in polar programs. Uh, we are funded, there isn't extra money for the people doing mountain glaciers, for example. They don't have a home. Um, we are trying to work at, with a, a support system that doesn't have the sort of icebreakers that some other countries have, that is flying planes that are 50 years old and held together with truly amazing work by hard-pressed mechanics, but they're 50-year-old planes. Uh, and no one has seriously changed the funding to answer these questions. And our meetings used to have meetings with policymakers and, and program managers. How do we grow the funding for young people so they can solve these problems. And I'm still here and they haven't, 
So, so th I, I truly think that this has not translated into a real commitment to solve the problems. And if with a few exceptions, and I would point out that what Helen has helped build with the ISSM, big hat tip to that effort, but there's a huge amount of work that has not happened. Uh, the fact that our field is still relying <laughs> This is true story, right? So the first thing I did in 1977 as a glaciologist was to draw lines on old radar records. Dusty figured out how to make that whole data set useful to the world and widely available. It is fantastically useful, but we're still relying heavily on flights that were made before 1977. And that's true. It, it is, uh, and, and you know, Nostalgia of touching old radar data aside, um, I think this intersects Ellen's point from from her opening statement, which I, is you know maybe the last question I'll ask, and we'll go to audience questions. Is you know Ellen, you mentioned integrating models and observations, and I think a lot of what Richard is talking about about here with old airplanes and old data is uh, we are not you know in a, in a data rich regime. There's in my own type of data of ice penetrating radar, we have many more observations at the bottom of the ice caps of Mars than we do on Earth. And so I guess for you as a, 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 a former NASA modeler who was building the models to use and assimilate uh, and take advantage of those observations, where do you see the balances and what are the greatest needs in terms of acquiring observations to enable the modeling to help us understand both the processes and improve our projections? Uh, thanks, Dusty, for this question. A great question again. So it's interesting that you're mentioning Mars because in some ways we know the thickness of ice caps on Mars a lot better than we do on Earth. On, in er on Earth, we know uh, we've done a lot of progress and, and don't take me wrong here. Uh, we've, uh, NASA had a recent ice bridge that allowed to cover the coast of Greenland to great extent, also a lot, lot, large parts of the coast around Antarctica but there are still places where we don't even know how thick the ice is. We don't have a single measurement for like tens of hundreds of kilometers. So how do you want to model something when you don't even know how thick the ice is? So that's one of the, the challenges we have. And again, we try to use model, put all sorts of physics observations to go together, derive algorithms so that we can find ways to, to, to make men not make up observations but fill in the gaps where we don't have these observations but that's a big limitation another example i wanted to mention is that um the first complete map of antarctic velocity dates from 2011 so that was just 10 years ago and so we've gone a long way since then now we start to have observations of of how fast the ice is moving on maybe monthly time scales in some places um, but again this is all at the surface and as soon as you go below the surface, we don't know the temperature of the ice. We don't know if the ice is frozen or melting at the base. We don't know what kind of rocks we have under. We don't know how ice is sliding over the bedrock. And, and this is really important because that this, the, uh, that, that's controlling how fast ice is going into the ocean and how fast we are discharging this ice into the ocean. So, so the, 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 the often we, 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 we have processes or parameters calibrated with just one or two points, but we would like to have more of these field observations so they don't calibrate with one point because you can fit a number of lines and, and things to one point or two points. So, so we need to have more of those. Um, we have in the US, we're lucky to have several places that do climate modeling um, and we have a few climate models, but these models don't include ice sheets, most of them. So the research is still done by a few people at universities or national labs that, that do these efforts that go into the IPCC on the weekend. So, so as was, Richard was saying, I'm not here to, to complain. I, this, is, this is wonderful what we're doing. I love it. I wouldn't change for, for a thing. But uh, given the, the pressure that we have and the need by the, for, for to have uh, answers and societal need, um, uh, we we do the best we can. We we models are great to integrate all this information from models, processes, observations, um, and so we try to put all of these together and do the best we can to provide uh, improved productions. Wonderful. Uh, as we start to pivot to, to audience questions, one just came in that seems an immediate follow-up to your comment, Ellen, so I'll, I'll put that to you. The, the 
the question from an anonymous attendee is if you could have any observational data to improve the models, what would your dream data set be? It depends if you if if this this dream has to be accessible kind of tomorrow or of completely whatever I want. If it's something that we we know we have the technology to do, I would say that having a better maps of just how thick the ice is everywhere, how being able to measure ice thickness in Greenland and Antarctica or everywhere would already be um, something great to do because first of all, that's something that's changing slowly, so we can measure it once and be good for probably decades. Um, if it was uh, completely open to with no restriction in technology or, or anything like that, um, there would be there are a few that would be interesting, but maybe knowing how, how ice is sliding over the bedrock and that implies a few things, but like how ice is, is what's under the ice would probably be another great priority to have. Awesome, thank you. So Catherine, there's a couple of questions that have come in here that are sort of related to um, various forms of communicating to the public. So, so there's one question which says, in spite of more frequent co coastal flooding incidences, people don't generally seem to be alarmed by sea level rise. What is needed to outreach or educate the public and policymakers? There's a, a related, or at least in, in this vein, question uh, asking, pointing out that the Calif uh, California Le Legislative Analyst Office just released a series of climate impact reports uh, that address cross-cutting effects, including that of sea level rise, should all coastal states and or the federal government be doing something similar. Uh, I guess looking at these in general, you know, uh, everything we're talking about here is how to better understand the ice sheets and uh, their contributions and their impacts. I guess these questions are really asking, like, as we get understanding, uh, how should we be thinking about communicating and doing something with that information? Uh, great. Okay. I was making so many notes already with regard to both of those questions. So I will try to keep this brief. So first on the, you know, how do people understand blood risk growing due to sea level rise and changing in its nature, not just the 1% annual chance flood, but the flooding on the high tides or the groundwater floods. I think the space of science communication um, has evolved a lot with regard to sea level rise and climate change, applying a lot of these best practices. So for example, if you understand something to be far away, distant, not about your daily life, way off into the future, people usually ignore it. On the flip side of that, if it's a end of the world scenario, which seems to be how most <laughs> newspapers like to report on IPCC reports, people also tune out. But between those two, oftentimes there's a recognition that if it becomes relevant to what people care about in their daily lives and they can connect with information, oftentimes there's a lot greater access. And so in the space of sea level rise, I would say one easy starting point, um, certainly something uh, here in South Florida, but there are a lot of national products as well, uh, viewers where you can say, for my home where I live, what is the flood risk? For the roads around me, um, how is that growing through time? Um, in terms of understanding the risk of sea level rise, we've done a lot of interviews and surveys in the South Florida context. You know, people have fish in their backyard um, already, so it's not necessarily kind of a hypothetical uh, far off future issue here. And I think the question is kind of as we look at regions uh, throughout the US, how does that shift through time? And then the second question that Dusty mentioned was California uh, going for the gold in terms of thinking about sea level rise planning. Probably not that surprising for those of you who live in California. Um, what I'll say though is that we're seeing a lot of efforts across um, the entirety of the nation. And under the current administration, for example, every federal agency is required to have an adaptation plan. Super cool. I think the only time I will ever be quoted is discussing a whole bunch of stuff about NASA was with regard to its adaptation plan. But you know, Department of Defense, how to think about how sea level rise actually shifts a lot of dimensions of security or the EPA, um, super fun sites that are now flooding or FEMA and flood insurance. So we're seeing a lot of mainstreaming across agencies of government and that pretty much applies whatever level of government you're looking at. Um, but even in that government action space, I would just point to one theme where a lot of the biggest coastal settlements in the US, whether it's the San Francisco Bay Area or metropolitan New York or Southeast Florida, we have whole teams of people developing strategies to keep options open, 
to think about revisions to all of the different ways that we plan for land use and disasters. But as we look throughout the US, much of the coastline doesn't have that level of privilege when it comes to figuring out what we do. And you know, Dusty, your point of um, major commercial actors, no sea level rise risk. What we really need to worry about is you know, every homeowner in a rural or extremely rural area of the country, um, where if your town is a few hundred people, you're not gonna have a whole office of your government working on sea level rise for you. Um, so thinking about kind of how to mainstream attention to sea level rise requires attention to the fact that there are a lot of differences across the context, you know, even within our one country. Well, thank you. There's, there's a couple of questions that I, I'd love to get Richard's thoughts on here that, that sort of relate to evolving estimates. So there, there's one here um, that talks about uh, client, uh, the term that's used in the question is climate system accelerators. I think in some ways, I mean, it's just new, new processes that, that result in larger numbers than were in previous IPCC projections. And there's a question around how would we know, what would we see to, to know that that's happening, that we're say missing processes that could accelerate. There's, there's another question which talks about, you know, there've been periods where large numbers were put out and then for say, at least that process, uh, the projections then uh, decrease. So I wonder if you could provide your thoughts on, on how, you know, someone who's attending this panel should think about that process of evolution in terms of thinking, in terms of numbers, in terms of what processes matter and don't, and, and how we, uh, and, and why and how those numbers change. Yeah, boy, there's a lot in there. Um, canaries in the coal mine, right? So, so, <laughs> John Scott Haldane was a, a Scottish physician around 1900. He figured out supplemental oxygen to save people who can't breathe. He figured out the bends and how to save people with it and what the diving tables should be. He solved altitude sickness and he um, figured out that carbon monoxide was killing coal miners and that if they took a more sensitive canary into the mine, they could watch the canary and when it got in trouble, they might be in trouble. Right? And people actually built cages to give the canary supplemental oxygen so they wouldn't die. But when when the canary fell over, the miners weren't sure they were in trouble, but they tended to get out in a big hurry anyway. The, the canaries in our coal mine are loss of ice shelves, thinning of ice shelves, breaking up of ice shelves, um, ex movement of the ocean into where there had been ice that wasn't floating, uh, warming of the oceans, changing of the winds. Uh, ice shelves around Antarctica tend to hold the ice back. Um, and they like to live in the coldest water in the world ocean. And so if you change anything, the best that can possibly happen is nothing. You bring in more coldest water. And usually you bring in something warmer because there's nothing colder. So changing winds, changing currents, those are the canaries in our coal mine. And then the question is, when, we, when the public sees the canary, keel over. The public does not yet know if the ice sheet will collapse, but will they respond or not? So, so there's, you know, some related questions, a, a, a number of them. Thank you everyone for these great questions. Keep them coming. Um, there's, there's sets of questions that I, I'd love to have Ellen's thought on that, that are pointing out that uh, a lot of our discussion has focused on uncertainty. Also, some of the questions highlight the effect of nonlinearities and, and highlight the fact that as we are evolving in our understanding and our projections, uh, just as Richard talked about, you know, uh, numbers go up, they go down, and we're trying to observe this and, and understand it in real time. So there's questions around what are the processes and timescales we think are involved before uh, you can, we think we'll be able to converge to sort of planning, you know, planning enabling uh, or, or the level of uncertainty that you could plan around with confidence. And so I guess, uh, you know, I'd love to hear at least, Ellen, initially your thoughts on sort of maybe two, 10, and 20 year time horizons in what, how you think our ability to understand and project these things would go. And then maybe a, a, I'd love to hear a follow on response from Catherine of what actually like planning, enabling uh, uncertainty is. 
Sure. So first of all, I just wanted to start by reminding that th these numbers changing, that's part of the scientific process. We find new mechanisms, we show them, we explain them, and maybe we don't understand them. We start to see them and understand, but uh, as time goes and we gather more observation, test more, more hypothesis, we tend to revise number. And that's same that the public is seeing that because there's so much tension on sea level and ice sheets. Uh, but these similar things are happening in other disciplines. So just, just wanted to remind that. So, so when you take numbers from, for example, from the IPCC, these tend to be more certain with, with validated processes included, but not, won't include the latest processes discovered. While if you look at the latest paper in Nature or Science, this is a brand new process that might have just been discovered and therefore uh, is a lot less certain. And there's still a lot of work to do to, to narrow down numbers from that process. So that's just, just wanted to remind that first. And then going back to your question of, of when do we, uh, will we improve the numbers? Um, I think it depends on what time scales you're looking at. If you're looking at the next 10 or 20 years, uh, some of the processes Richard was talking about are, are unlikely to happen. And so we, we can start to narrow down the numbers. But when we look at beyond 2100, for example, then, then everything is still wide open. And as we still don't have, as again, Richard was saying, we don't, we don't want to just extrapolate number. We don't know what could happen. And so maybe we are gonna find yet another process that we didn't think about, we didn't know about. So, so these numbers will take a lot, looking at the, the, the far further in the future, we're gonna look at, we're looking at the harder it is to reduce uncertainty. So, so that would be my, my short answer here and i'd be curious to to hear what richard has to add to that okay great yeah let's see richard and then we'll come back to, to catherine so what, what do you think richard how, how yeah. did it go so, so i think overall that that we give uncertainties the uncertainties always sort of have this long tail on the bad side and if we learn more and that narrows the uncertainty we have not changed our answer and we routinely get accused of oh you changed your answer no okay that's that's sort of a, a bad thing and that a learning to if we're making decisions and there's a lot we don't know and you average over all the possible decisions the cost of allowing co2 to warm the world is huge and then you get scientists to narrow the uncertainties that saves you money in the long term so 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 that that's really important i am still nervous that there's a possibility of really fast changes even before 2100 to be perfectly honest i hope there is not i hope we don't get there the chances are much greater if we continue to warm rapidly and so um, if we don't take actions to reduce the warming and we actually do force a lot of warming it's possible that really fast things could happen in the lifetime of our students. So, so, so Catherine, you know, in my uh, having been both a, a scientist and engineer at JPL, there's this sort of uh, dynamic that plays out when you're trying to develop an instrument. Uh, and so initially, you know, an engineer will say, okay, well, we, we want the how good of numbers do you need? And a scientist will say the best numbers possible. And then an engineer goes, well, that's meaningless. How about like whatever the units are, one meter, you know, or one centimeter, you know, one degree, whatever the units of resolution are. And the scientist says, yeah, that's fine. And the moment scientists say, yeah, that's fine, the engineer will be like, well, what about 1.1? About two. You know, what do you actually really need? And so at the risk of doing the same thing to you, uh, in terms of sea level uncertainty, like what, what, what really is the requirement, what really is enabling to allow uh, greater planning adaptation um, and how good is, is actually not good enough? Yeah, great question. I guess what I would say, um, I feel like Richard gave a really um, sobering punt on the uncertainty ball here before I pick it up, um, but kind of before he raised the, the possibility of, you know, scenarios that are even above some of the upper bounds used in planning right now. I think where a lot of the decision-making space has gone um, has been towards scenarios of sea level rise and flooding that resonate much more with decision-making needs as compared to some of the scientific uh, tensions that, for example, Helen described, where there has been huge 
process, uh, progress and how to deal with kind of some of these biggest uncertainties, even in the very technical uh, working group one type physical science based assessment, but recognizing that from the space of decision making, actually knowing that full range of possible outcomes is helpful, even if it's hard to say exactly how probable any given outcome is across that spectrum. So a lot of the scenario space has gone, you know, here's a low bound, here's a you know, middle of the road bound, and here's a high one, and here's actually an extremely high bound of how much sea level rise might happen over the course of the century and beyond. And oftentimes having that full range has been really helpful because it has pushed the planning into the space of kind of pressure testing responses. So we've got maybe the, the wide range of what may happen, what starts to fail really badly under some of the higher scenarios of sea level rise, and what does that mean for what you might want to plan for earlier on? And just to give one specific example, um, the Thames barrier protecting the city of London is one of the first pieces of infrastructure globally to have a sea level rise plan for a hundred year time frame. So it's a convenient big example to point to. And the planning there basically pegged what would happen through time, not based on the year, 2040, 2060, but instead based on how much sea level rise occurs. And the rationale there is that oftentimes we know what will be impacted under a foot, two feet, four feet, six feet, nine feet, and a lot of the impacts go up nonlinearly. Um, and some of the bigger questions are about kind of when for those ranges of sea level rise. And so kind of shifting this to what breaks when under increasing sea level rise and what actions would be needed at any given point of how much sea level rise has occurred and using that as a guide for planning. Wonderful. Well, I, I, I've noted now we're, uh, we're two minutes before the hour, and so I'm sure a lot of people will have to step off. But before they do, um, I just wanted to again thank everyone for attending, thank our, our panelists for participating. Um, these webinars and panels always are so educational, and I, I will say now that it's the first time participating in one of these webinar ones, it's, it's even more fun on this side. Uh, and so I've learned a lot, and I'm really grateful that the, the Woods Institute continues to be a space where conversations like this can happen. Um, I will say that if you got really interested in this and enjoyed this, uh, there are many other recorded uh, webinars of this kind you can listen to and uh, future ones you can participate in on the Woods website. Uh, and if you got super into ice sheets, uh, the International Glaciological Society also has a weekly seminar series with videos that you can go and just, you know, blow maybe maybe 100 hours at this point. Uh, and so uh, hopefully uh, you do one or both of those things and, and thank, thank you all again for, for making this possible.